everyone, welcome back to Kochi TV. In this video, we're going to take a close look at VO2 Max and specifically the two properties that make up the overall concept of VO2 Max, and that is central and peripheral VO2 Max. Two terms that I've thrown around quite a bit on this channel in previous videos, but I want to take some time to really look at them, both of them kind of um, separately and then together how they work together to make overall VO2 Max improvements. So, we're really thinking about here overall what's the difference and really focusing on what is VO2 max to begin with and why does it matter and how do we improve both aspects of VO2 max and in this video I'm really going to focus on um, cross country 5k just because here on June 12th that's what most of the country who are distance runners are going to be getting ready for in the fall time but obviously VO2 max is important for um, all of your distance or middle distance races right from the 800 all the way out to marathon or even ultra marathon all of those races are characterized by most of the energy more than 50 percent of the energy being supplied from the aerobic system and vo2 max is a really critical aspect to all of those races it's different uh vo2 max is different based on what race you're doing the one that it's most important to will find is the 5k so it does make a lot of sense but just know that improving vo2 max will help all of those races from the 800 all the way out to as long as a human could possibly go um and this is our 2019 our last year's um morton boys and girls cross country varsity team and it was just after we ran at the spanish river invitational um one of uh what i think was one of the better races we ran um last year both just as a program and it was just a really well executed meet from spanish river high school which is kind of sort of down by the miami area um if you know um how florida is situated so um, it was a really good day for um both the boys and girls teams there last year in september when we went i am kyle giacono i'm the head boys cross country and track coach at wharton high school in tampa florida and i have been for the last seven years if you would like a closer look at my credentials they are on the screen okay so as i said i'm going to focus really on the cross country 5k only because that's what most of the country is getting ready for right now on June 12th. Um, but again, as I mentioned, it really could factor into all these races, but I'm just going to highlight the metrics here of the 5K since this is what most people are going to be worrying about right now. So, um, race win predictor. Um, study that was done by um, Ingham in 2008, and I talk about the study very often. It looked at the 800, the, the 1500, the, the 5K, and it looked at the 10K. And they were trying to look for basically what was it that made one person win and one person not win essentially what was the the one indicator and they looked at many different things to kind of figure out what it was for the different races and when they looked at the 5k they found a single predictor and it was vo2 max whoever could use the most oxygen whoever had the highest vo2 max um when tested won the race 94.3 percent of the time that's as close as a sure thing as you can get in life so if we're looking at the 5k we'll see that it is critical success in the 5k is absolutely directly tied to vo2 max and as we said there's two aspects of vo2 max so just to highlight that that's the reason why it's really important to know these two parts because you have to develop both aspects of vo2 max to improve overall vo2 max so race specific vo2 max from ustf distance curriculum and i'll look at this um on the next slide very specifically um the 5K is run at 97% VO2 max, okay? So it's run a little bit slower, but it's pretty close. It's run at 97% of the pace. One of the best tests for VO2 max is two miles to exhaustion. Two miles is obviously a little bit shorter than the 5K by a little bit over one mile. So it makes perfect sense that whoever has the best VO2 max um, is going to um, have that success. And also the 5K being so close to it, that's why there's that very direct interconnection between these two both pace being so close to vo2 max and vo2 max being so closely associated with who wins this race and this study that was uh first uh put out by dr matter and dr hartman they work very closely with the iaaf um it was put out in 2018 when they looked at the percentages of the three main ways that the body recharges atp um again it's a misnomer to say that we have three energy systems we have one energy system that has three components to how it's made up um, they found that 4% of the energy in the uh, 5K was recharged by, well, first just the ATP that was sitting in your muscles, and then the phosphocretin system, collectively called the alactic system. 10% from the anaerobic glycolytic system, that, that longer speed system that eventually causes the increase of acid to accumulate in your body. And then not surprisingly, 86% of the energy comes from 
um, the aerobic system, aerobic system, VO2 max, we're all tied all together. So again, you can really see why the 5K, just because of everything that makes it what it is, is so connected with VO2 max. Okay, and law of training specificity, don't want to get too much into training theory, but this is really important to understand that every training session that either you put yourself through or if you're a coach, um, you put your team through, has a specific training effect on that athlete. Okay, that means that you do workout A, adaptation or result A happens in that person. You do workout B, result B happens in terms of adaptation for that athlete, okay? You do workout A, it doesn't mean that adaptation B is going to happen, okay? Unless there's some kind of interconnection there, right? It's just that there is a very direct correlation. You have a specific training, you have a specific result. That's how it works. And even more importantly, which may or may not be desired for the event. So that's important. Just because you're doing a workout doesn't mean you're making yourself better. And when we're talking about how important VO2 max is, we really need to focus on workouts that improve this and definitely don't hinder VO2 max. Or if they do hinder it, there has to be a specific reason in terms of some of these energy contributions or something else that you're seeing that's missing in your athlete. So you have to have that specific idea. So what we're really focusing on is what's the best way to improve all aspects of VO2 max, both central and peripheral, to help with cross-country 5K success. And if you were in track season and you were looking at the 3200 meter or the 1600 meter or 800 meter or whatever it is, that the 10K if you're going on the longer side, um, you would still want to know how that would um, help with success in those specific races. These numbers would change, but that would still be the question in mind. How would VO2 max, when we're looking at this, what do we need to do with that in terms of um, the percentages? The accuracy of the, the wind predictor would be different based on those different races. The percentage of VO2 max and the energy supply, those would all be different. But that idea of training law of training specificity still needs to be considered and that question based on whatever aspect you're looking at. And to just kind of drive home that point, just to sort of make it in an easier way to understand instead of saying law of training specificity, basically you just need to know your why, okay? If you know your why, that's basically understanding training specificity. If you know why you're doing it to improve some aspect of VO2 max and you know all this, you're you're pretty much golden. Um, I myself, I'm an English teacher on, on uh, my normal um, part of the day, my most important part of the day. Um, and that's one of the big things I'm always worried about with my class is knowing your why. You know, if we're doing something, you know, don't just know what you're doing, know why you're doing it. And that's really the specific thing to take away from this whole idea. Okay. So where does VO2 max fit in? Um, that last slide I talked about the USAATF tr uh, distance curriculum. This is the entirety that I'm pulling that from. And we're really looking at right here, VO2 max. So this is an energy continuum that goes from the fastest possible pace a human could run, which would be the alactic energy system, all the way down to 65% is the lowest intensity you would ever train anybody at. Anything lower than that, and you're just doing it for you know, general maybe losing of weight or something like that. And on this, you can see all these different paces, you know, special endurance one and two, speed endurance, intensive tempo, all these different terms, aerobic, lactic threshold. And you've got up here, it shows you where different races kind of fit in with that. So the 800 is obviously faster than a marathon is going to be. VO2 max is right here and it's sitting at 100% because this is based on energy continuum at percentage of VO2 max. So the idea being VO2 max is best tested with a two mile, 3K is going to be a little bit faster. We talked about the 5K being a little bit slower. It's at 97%. 10K is gonna be at 92%. We would find that if we had 15K it would be right in here, right at lactic threshold, marathon pace. So that's the idea of where this kind of fits in <laughs> with all of these other different races and paces and things like that, just so you understand that VO2 max, or really more importantly, I'd say the velocity at which your body reaches VO2 max would be kind of right in the middle here. It's the fastest aerobic pace. It's at a point where you start to have increased demand from the um, anaerobic glycolytic system or that system that's going to accumulate acid. In fact, if you look right here, you can see that the green number is the percentage of energy that comes from the aerobic system versus the anaerobic system. So I showed you um, earlier on that percentage for the 5K. Well, um, and these are actually old numbers. Um, Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman have a much more... Um, closely associated um, statistics with that, but that's something else you can kind of look at. But again, this is older data, so not too, too critical, but you can obviously know that the faster it goes, the more intense it goes, the more contribution from the anaerobic system too. So I talked a lot about VO2 max, but I really haven't explained what VO2 max is. What the heck is VO2 max? Well, what is it? All right. Well, it's your body's maximum ability to use oxygen. I mentioned this very briefly. Basically, 
your body is going to have a certain ability to use oxygen. And we'll talk about this even a little bit more later on, but your body can only use so much oxygen. That is VO2 max, or the volume of oxygen that is maximally used in the human body. It's typically expressed in milliliters of O2 consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute. The idea being is if you're somebody who's bigger, you should just naturally use more um, oxygen. So just being bigger doesn't improve your VO2 max because you're going to use more oxygen just because you have more body weight. The idea being is specific training, your body will build structures that will be able to use more O2 when also balanced per kilogram of body weight. So that's where this is actually going to be. And again, it's in per per minute. So if we want to look at some comparables, this is what this number is right here so an animal that is very unaerobic they move very slowly but they don't really do very it's not quick like it's not quick sustained essentially a tree sloth not you know doesn't have a very developed um, aerobic system so their vo2 max they're only going to use 20 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute okay all the way down here you see a hummingbird think about how fast a hummingbird wings beat just for baseline just to stay in the air they're just going crazy that is all aerobic it's just going to town all day with those wings and then we know it's aerobic because it doesn't really have to stop if it stops it's gonna fall and so that's how one of the things that we know that it's aerobic so a hummingbird is obviously smaller than say a tree sloth but when you again correct for kilogram of body weight we'll see that hummingbirds are so much more aerobic they can use so much more oxygen 756 millimeter uh, milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute they're aerobic machines they can go all day sled dogs maybe not so much as a hummingbird but just think about if a sled dog is pulling a sled through cold conditions just all day that's super aerobic work a racehorse um, see these animals are getting bigger so they're doing work but they're gonna get more fatigued bigger body weight there's, diff there's different reasons that kind of happens with that but just kind of think about that the hummingbird being so small but being able to do that amount of work for so long that's really why they're just you know this aerobic machine and then really interestingly right in here we have untrained human beings so baseline humans 36 so a little bit less than twice more aerobic um, than say a tree sloth kind of interestingly funny enough that's exactly identical to a pig so when you are first starting out running you have the same aerobic capacity or really thought more correctly vo2 max of a pig okay but the interesting thing is as we talked about the idea of um you know getting that training effect specific training a trained human can basically double their vo2 max humans are very trainable when it comes to this we have the ability to adapt to it when we're given the specific exposure to it the human body is really great at this especially with um the aerobic properties that we have we can almost double our ability to use oxygen maximally which is really important for aerobic work especially with the 5k because of how tied this is so obviously this trained person they're Obviously, there's other reasons too, but this trained person is never going to lose to this untrained person. And one of the key reasons to that is the ability to use oxygen so much more. And a human, I mean, you know, a racehorse typically isn't designed to run a 5K, but a human is not going to beat a racehorse in a 5K. We're not going to beat a sled dog. I'm assuming if you could get a hummingbird to go in a straight line for a 5K, there's no way we're going to lose to any of those animals too. But we're going to dust a tree sloth. Even an untrained person is going to dust a tree sloth, right? So that just kind of can, can keep it in mind. I usually deal with vvo2 max if we put a little v in front of this because that would be the velocity at which you reach vo2 max that last slide that we were looking at that's really what we're dealing with there what pace is your body what when you're running at a specific pace say maybe it's five minute pace or whatever you can run two miles in in 10 minutes the velocity at which your body uses uh reaches vo2 max or maximum oxygen consumption that's vvo2 max that's typically more important for a coach and i'm gonna have um a video in the description down below about how to, to use vo2 max to um, not just test it but also set up some different workouts you might want to consider looking at those that's really more important but this is just kind of something to look at because you can see this number doubles essentially so that's kind of an interesting thing um, to kind of note with the specific training all right so um, we promised this idea of looking at central versus peripheral vo2 max look at, let's look at these two aspects um, specifically and see how they kind of come together then so first central vo2 max i'm going to highlight this in green and peripheral in yellow it'll make sense on the next slide so just keep that in mind central vo2 max improvement 
any general aerobic work done continuously or near continuously. We talk about this in um, the videos in the description down below for the long and recovery runs as well as um, VO2 max intervals. Um, the idea being is this generally improves um, with just any type of aerobic work. It can be aerobic threshold easy pace runs or if you're doing something like intervals which is a fast bout of work with a rest period but if you're doing active recovery like a jog in between that's what I mean by near continuous so any of those things can help central VO2 max development it generally improves as the body this is the key thing increases the ability to move oxygen from the heart outward Think of the heart as the center, okay? You might think, well, why isn't it from the lungs outward? Lungs are actually overdeveloped organs in humans. You never really think about um, training the lungs because they're already overdeveloped for, for humans. We're, we're never really going to have that issue. If you don't have an injury or something like that to your lungs where something has to be removed or damaged or whatever, that's not ever going to be the issue for humans. It's really starting with the heart, that center part. And it improves as your body gets the ability to, from your heart, move more oxygen outward. So that's why it's called central VO2 max. We're moving the oxygen from the center outward. So as that improves, central VO2 max improves. The key to central VO2 max improvement is continuous runs, or as we talked about, near continuous runs of 20 minutes, at least 20 minutes. I really bring this up much more um, why so and by looking at a few studies and the recovery runs and long run videos in the description down below. For the sake of this, if you want you know, a bigger explanation, look at those videos. But if you're not going for 20 continuous or very near continuous minutes, as we talked about with intervals, you're not improving central VO2 max. You're just not. The human body doesn't want to build some body structures that take energy. Energy is calories. Calories are survival. And if you don't do it for more than 20 continuous minutes, your body is not going to improve central VO2 max. All right, let's look at peripheral VO2 max. Again, just for the sake of the next slide, remember that is going to be in yellow. Peripheral VO2 max improvements is improved with aerobic power work only. Okay, so we talked about VO2 max, or it's really, I probably should have put VVO2 max right here, the velocity. That's 100%, right? That's your two mile pace. It's workouts done very close to it. So 98 to 101% of it, not 97%, which is 5K pace, not 103%, 98 to 101%. That is the only way to really, truly improve peripheral VO2 max. And there's a really key reason for that that I'll talk about in a second. It generally improves as the body increases the ability of the working muscles. So those are the periphery, right? Working muscles are away from your center. That's where we want the oxygen to go. And for that peripheral, the working muscles, to extract oxygen from blood for use in the mitochondria. This is where aerobic respiration, aerobic energy is done. So central VO2 max is getting the oxygen from the center or the heart outward. But that's really less important than, I mean, well, it, it, they're, they're equally important, right? If we don't move it from the heart outward, but we have to get it into the working muscles. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how much oxygen we can use. That's why you can't just do continuous runs. You have to also work in aerobic power workouts. In the center, in the, uh, excuse me, the VO2 max intervals workout in the description down below, I really go through a study that really shows why this is critically important. Um, if you want a really close understanding of that, but in order to get your working muscles to build more of um, a substance called myoglobin, we're going to discuss a little bit more in the next slide, which is what pulls the oxygen off your blood for use in the mitochondria at the working muscles. So that's the periphery. Those are the only way you're going to improve that, and your body needs to be running right at very close to oxygen debt to get your body to build that myoglobin so the working muscles at the periphery can extract oxygen from the blood. So as you can see, these two work in tandem, okay? Your body isn't going to be able to use more oxygen at the working muscles if it's not there, so VO2 max won't improve without central VO2 max improving. And then even if your body is moving more oxygen to the working muscles, if the working muscles aren't using it, then your VO2 max still isn't going to improve. So you have to develop both of these equally in tandem to make this work. Forgot there's one more thing here. So the key to peripheral VO2 max is running right at current VO2 max. I already said that, so no big deal. So again, you have to move oxygen from the center for the working muscles to use it. It's used at the working muscles. That is what improves VO2 max. And if you don't have the um, structures on the peripheral muscles, the working muscles to extract, it doesn't matter how much you're moving. So as you can see, this is a very close knit situation and you have to improve both equally in tandem for VO2 max to improve. I promised uh, this a little bit more description on this. So understand oxygen movement and use 
is always going to be the bottleneck for, I would say humans, but I can't think of one that it's not for any type of um, animal that lives on land. Like, there are some, you know, whales and things like that that can hold their breath for a very long period of time, but at least for a land-based animal like humans, for, for us, oxygen movement and use is going to be the bottleneck no matter what, okay? Humans can store weeks worth of fuel. You hear stories about this. People lost out in the wilderness and they had nothing to eat or very little to eat for weeks. And they came out looking a whole lot skinnier, but they survived. Why? Humans can store, specifically fat can be stored for weeks. Even a very skinny distance runner has a large amount of fat stores that they can use for energy use over a very long period of time. We don't store nearly as much what's called glycogen that's stored glucose, that's fast fuel, that is um, only about two hours worth of fast fuel, but altogether humans can store you know, weeks worth of fuel. And we can score, store a decent amount of water, can si depending on the conditions, you know, if you're not out in, you know, 120 degree weather running around the whole time, this isn't the case, but under somewhat normal conditions, which I wouldn't call Tampa, Florida in the summertime normal conditions, but say a normal part of, you know, the world, normal temperate type climates, you can go, you know, a few days, maybe a day or two, if you're keeping, you know, you're not going around doing a lot of work, worth of water. We can store some water. We have no way to store oxygen. Very important reasons why. One, hopefully under normal conditions that will never come up. Where a human will not be able to breathe for more than, you know, a minute or so. But also because oxygen is very corrosive, if we stored it, we'd have to figure out a way to neutralize um, this corrosive material. So th there's just no, there's no mechanism for storing it and there really shouldn't be any need for us to store it. So this is what we're trying to improve here is this idea that oxygen movement, the central part, and use, the peripheral part, is the bottleneck and we have to specifically train it. Improving oxygen movement, again, central VO2 max and use peripheral VO2 max, takes specific training for these adaptations. That's the key part here. Central VO2 max, as we just said, general aerobic work. Typically, it's thought of as um, aerobic threshold, long and recovery runs, but I'll put in the description down below, tempo running can be central VO2 max development. And if you do them correctly, intervals, races, um, other intervals like alactic runs, fly 30s, or short hill intervals can also do that. And then the peripheral ones, the specific training for peripheral, as we said, only through aerobic power work, um, typically through intervals through most of the season, also your VO2 max test. Races maybe a little bit, even the 5K, it's not, a, it's not gonna get a lot. Um, but maybe it gets a little bit sort of um, along with it, but it takes that specific training to get both of these aspects to improve so we can improve this bottleneck of oxygen movement and oxygen use um, in the body. Okay, so this is the slide that I said, make sure you remember that yellow is peripheral VO2 max and green is central. It's for this slide right here. VO2 max adaptations come from these things that are on the screen here, okay? I'll start with peripheral first, just, nah, I'll start with central first, actually, it makes more sense. Um, those general aerobic work um, done at at least 20 continuous minutes or very near continuous minutes, you're gonna have more aerobic enzymes. You're convincing your body that you're gonna be producing more energy than just needs at baseline um, for aerobic work. So they're gonna produce more enzymes that help you produce more energy aerobically. You're going to develop more mitochondria. So the mitochondria factor is going to be split into between these. Your body is going to produce more mitochondria. Mitochondria is what produces energy with the aerobic enzymes. So this is going to help you produce more energy aerobically, use that oxygen correctly. So this is how this is another reason why it's going to improve VO2 max. You're going to also improve your red blood cells. They're going to become better at what they do, which is move oxygen. Moving oxygen is all about central VO2 max, so that's another key thing. Here's a real big one. We talked about the heart being the center part of central VO2 max. Your heart will get bigger doing these 20 continuous minutes, specifically the left ventricle. That's the big pump that moves the blood to the rest of your body. If it is pumping more blood with each beat, well, that means we're moving more oxygen, um, oxygen-rich um, blood, it's going to be red blood cells that are going to be improved for carrying more oxygen. When it gets to where it needs to, you're going to have more enzymes and more mitochondria to do what it needs. So as you can see, all of these things stack up on each other. Also, you're going to increase muscle capillarization, especially the working muscles. Specifically, in this case, we're dealing with legs. You've got a working muscle. Maybe it has two capillaries before you start training, and after a year of training, maybe it's got four. It has doubled the amount of oxygen-rich blood 
that could potentially go to those muscles. So not only do we have a bigger heart to pump blood, we have more pathways for it to go through closer to the working muscles. So those improved red blood cells can carry more oxygen to them. And then with the aerobic enzymes and the more mitochondria, we can make more use of all that more oxygen that is moving around. You're also just gonna have more blood, about a half liter to a liter of blood after about six months worth of training. This is why you would never want either yourself or someone you're training to donate blood, you know, within six months of a really big race. Um, this is obviously a really, you know, big thing. We need blood um, to help people and everything, but um, there's gonna be other parts of your life, especially if you're dealing with high schoolers. L let's leave that for when our running days are over so that we can um, make use of this adaptation too. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that's another big thing to deal with here also. Um, you're gonna have more blood, it's improved, it's moving through more pathways, being pumped by a bigger heart, there's more enzymes, more mitochondria. Again, you can see all of those things stacking up on each other. Now, we talk about um, peripheral VO2 max. There are fewer adaptations that do that, but they are very important. More myoglobin, this is the key thing. So these are the ones that are developed from training right at VO2 max 98 to 101% due to forcing the body to operate right at oxygen dead. You put your body right at that point where I can supply the oxygen, but I'm really close. You convince your body to build myoglobin. Myoglobin sounds a lot like hemoglobin, which you've heard with red blood cells. Hemoglobin is what holds oxygen on your blood. Myoglobin is what's in your working muscles that takes it off the red blood cells into the working muscles. The kind of goofy, silly way that I think about this, I remember this, is myoglobin is these oxygen, the, uh, excuse me, the uh, working muscles are demanding oxygen, so they say that it's mine and it pulls it off of the red blood cells and it makes work of it. This structure, your body doesn't want to use this, doesn't want to build this, doesn't need it, and you have to convince that it needs more of it by running right at oxygen debt. If you run too slowly, you run at 95%, your body's like, I'm good. I've got enough myoglobin to make this happen. You go faster, 102, 103, 105% closer to mile pace, and two things are gonna happen. Some of those muscles are gonna shut down because the increased acidity is gonna fatigue them, so they're not gonna be accepting more oxygen anyway. They're in a state of fatigue, and the blood that has been, you know, improves in all these different ways we've talked about is gonna be moving past the working muscles too fast because your heart rate is gonna be going higher. So your body's also gonna say, I don't need more myoglobin, I can't even pull it off the, off the um, blood because it's going by so fast. So that's why it's that sweet spot, why it's such a narrow range. You gotta convince your body by running right at that point of, I'm okay, but I don't wanna be put this close to oxygen debt again. So that's one of the key factors here. Myoglobin needs to be improved with uh, peripheral VO2 max improvement by running right at VO2 max. 98 to 101 percent is also aerobic power. I do interchange those terms. VO2 max is typically is actually 100 percent. Aerobic power is 98 to 101 percent. And then also you're going to get bigger mitochondria. So that's a little side benefit of it. Also, the mitochondria produce most of the aerobic energy every time you take one molecule of, of fuel, either fat or a carbohydrate, your body takes one of those with the mitochondria and with something called the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Doesn't really matter, those are kind of big terms, but those two things together make 36 ATP molecules with one molecule of fuel. That's very efficient. 34 of those 36 come from the, the membranes, the outer and inner membranes of the mitochondria. So if they get bigger, there's more space on those membranes, they can produce more energy with the mitochondria. So more mitochondria is important because you have more of them, but if you make each of them bigger, well now we're getting a two for one special here. We've got more mitochondria and they're bigger. We've just increased our aerobic capacity or really again our VO2 max in both ways by doing that. Okay, so you can see more things are happening with central VO2 max because it's more, more complex, right? You're moving oxygen from the heart to all these different parts of your body. This may seem more simple, but it's actually a little bit more tricky to have happen just because of the, the narrow range of this. And again, as you can see that these work together, the green moves the oxygen throughout your body, the central part of it, and then the yellow is how the peripheral muscles make use of it. Here's something else down here, it's not highlighted with anything, but if your athletes are getting older, and I, you know, I'll usually bring this up at some point with, with my group, I'm dealing with high schoolers, so you've got freshmen that are as young as 14 and seniors that are old as 18. The 18 year olds might be getting closer to actual maturity, so they might not be having as much, but say you take a sophomore who's 15, 
and five months later into the season, they've gotten five months older. They're actually going to improve their VO2 max just because their body is more mature, more solidified, all of those different things. So that actually is something that you really can't control as a coach, but it will also improve both of these aspects of VO2 max, both central and peripheral. That's why it's not highlighted, but it also should be considered the age of your athlete and where they are just from their natural progression, not just your training-induced um, changes. And um, I've mentioned this um, very briefly, but adaptations, um, these improvements to the aerobic system, VO2 max, are all structural in nature, okay? These things all take creating something, enzymes, mitochondria, either more of them or, or bigger of them, improving the way the blood cells are, changing the structures of them, changing the structure of your heart, building structures, your capillaries, producing more structures, producing the myoglobin. These are all building something, either something, you know, more of something or something better of something, for lack of a better term. So building structures of anything, you build up, you build a building, it takes a lot of time to make that happen, right? To make something out of nothing or improve something that isn't as strong. So they're structural in nature and they require a lot of time to be fully developed, 20 plus weeks. This is why you do your aerobic work starting now. Um, again, I'm making this video on June 12th. Um, it's why you start your aerobic training before your um, anaerobic training for say cross country or track or whatever you're doing. It takes 20 plus weeks. That's the amount of time to fully develop both aspects of VO2 max, at least for one training cycle, both peripheral and um, central VO2 max. All right, so wrapping up some key points here about the differences between central and peripheral VO2 max, um, a little bit about how you train them, but if you want a closer description of that, description um, down below, recovery runs, long runs, tempo runs, VO2 max runs, and I'll put the other ones in there too, the, the strength type runs and how you can make them central VO2 max in nature. Um, and also, you know, just to get a better idea of why training both of them creates that bigger hole of VO2 max. VO2 max is the single biggest predictor for success in the 5K. I'm really focusing on the 5K again because of when this video is coming out, but it's also very important to success in the, the mile, the half mile, the, the two mile, or, or the 10K. Um, and when we get to that part of the, the year, I'll probably redo this video kind of focusing on those aspects of it. But for right now, it's the single biggest indicator for the 5K it would be different levels for those other races. VO2 max is the body's max ability to use oxygen. How much oxygen can you use in a minute, okay? And that is very trainable, um, and oxygen movement and use is the bottleneck in aerobic work. So moving it, using it, that's the bottleneck. We talked about the reasons why for that earlier. Um, but, you know, that's something that we really want to kind of figure out. What is the maximum use? Understanding it's the bottleneck and figure out how to train it. VO2 max improves in two different ways. We've got central VO2 max is how the body moves oxygen from the heart. That's the center part of central outward. This improves with general aerobic work done continuously or near continuously. Peripheral VO2 max is how the body uses oxygen at the working at the muscles, the periphery. This improves with work done right at aerobic power. That's 98 to 101 percent of current VO2 max pace, VVO2 max. And last thing, VO2 max improvements are all structural in nature. This means they take a lot of time to happen as they improve as the body structures are built or rebuilt to better move or use oxygen. For this reason, they require 20 plus weeks to maximize improvement. You're going to get improvement after two to four weeks. Adaptation takes two to four weeks. But to maximize it, you need 20 plus weeks. Um, in previous videos I've talked about, I really sort of like about 23 weeks. You go more than about 25, 26, and it's not, it's, you're actually going to potentially go on a downward um, after the, the peaking cycle. Um, but I mean, 20 plus weeks, just keep that in mind. Almost nobody is going to, with this case, almost nobody has the problem with having too much time. It's almost always the problem of do you have enough time to make it happen. So figure out when your state meet is or wherever the last meet is that you're trying to get to. Try and figure out a way to have 20 plus weeks. Obviously, you're, you're, you've got the situation you have. But as you're planning this, maybe in, in subsequent years, you want to maximize the aerobic system. 20 plus weeks is sort of the barrier of entry to maximize VO2 max improvement. Central VO2 max improves with increased heart size, more capillaries, more mitochondria, more aerobic enzymes, more blood, and improved red blood cells. So these all have to do with moving oxygen from the center outward. The peripheral VO2 max improves because of increased myoglobin and larger mitochondria using it at the working muscles or the periphery. So 
that takes us through these two com these two somewhat complex ideas, central VO2 max and peripheral VO2 max. But I think now that you probably have a better idea of what each of them are, you can see why they work together to, to improve VO2 max. And as we said, VO2 max, single biggest indicator for success in the 5K. If you right now are getting yourself ready for the 5K, that is really important to know. How do I improve both of these aspects to overall improve VO2 max so I can have the most success in this race if you are somebody getting ready for a cross country season right now. So if you like this video, please think about liking or subscribing. It really does help the channel to um, grow, um, increase subscribers, increase likes. It appears in other people's um, feeds the more of that happens. So it just um, helps the channel overall. Um, I've also loved just, you know, the amount of comments and questions that have been happening um, recently in the last little bit. I really love that. As you can see, I'm, you know, as wordy in those answers writing wise as I am in these, um, these presentations. So I absolutely love doing that. I think it helps me better go through the information. I love figuring out why something is and, and you know, if I maybe help somebody else figure out their why and better understand this, all the better. So if you have a question or a comment, please ask those in the, in the description down below. I love that answering or, or commenting on those. Now, after this video, I'm going to take a look at specific prep training for cross country. Um, here in Tampa, Florida, we're allowed to restart training with our kids on Monday, June 15th. So I'm also going to be able to start doing some workout videos again. Um, by keeping distance and all that, we have different protocols. So it's going to look a little bit different than some of the videos I've presented in the past with workout videos. Um, but I'm going to be mixing those in along with um, specific prep training, that second phase of your cross country training year after general prep, looking at what you're trying to do in specific prep, how long it takes, and the specific workouts that it entails first starting with medium hill intervals, which actually starts at the tail end and starts off specific prep. So look forward for um, those videos in the next coming days. And until next time, this has been Coach ETV.